The Bible is full of field of dream moments. If Noah would build the ark, God would send the animals two by two. If Elisha would dig ditches in the desert, God would flood them. If the widow would borrow empty jars, God would fill them with oil. I think one recurring theme that I'm feeling as I read this book again this year is just a reminder that we follow our dreams because of nudges that we have in our heart. And to keep focused on the dream giver and not the dream. And I love how in the beginning he starts this chapter with, if you build it, they will come. But he ends the chapter by saying, if you build it, he will come. I needed that encouragement right now in the midst of even planning portraits of white. Yes, I'm building it, but I'm trusting that he's going to finish it and he will come. Welcome to the Brand New Me Podcast. I'm Frances. And I'm Pam. And we are two women passionate about helping others thrive in life, not just survive. In each episode, we're going to find creative ways to offer hope for your future through our own life experiences. So join us every week as we learn together that we really can be a brand new me. Welcome to episode number 64 of the Brand New Me podcast. I'm Francis, and I want to welcome you. We have been reading through Mark Batterson's book, Chase the Lion. It's an amazing book about pursuing the 500-pound dreams and lions in your life, the things you want to go after and see happen. And we are in chapter 8, Field of Dreams. We encourage you to... Think about what are you passionate about? What is your field of dreams? What do you want to build? What do you want people to come to and be encouraged by? Because they've been in your field. Pam, what struck you in this chapter, chapter 8, field of dreams. If you build it, they will come. Well, I would say, first of all, there's a gentleman who Mark had talked to who was an amazing man. He did many works of God and he had written down this vision, but he wrote the vision down because he got awake at four in the morning. And so I want to talk about this, Francis, because we get awake in the middle of the night I want to go back to sleep. But this gentleman is saying, when I'm wide awake at that hour, and he says four o'clock, because I guess he kept getting awake at four o'clock. He says to pay attention. At that hour and hours before that, I only want to pay attention to how am I going to go back to sleep. So tell me how you deal with when you wake up in the morning, is it in the middle of the night, I should say, Is it God calling you? What's your thought on that? Well, when I read that, I I read it as if it wasn't normal for him to wake up at that time in the morning. And so when he did, he paid attention to it. For me, I would say there would have been a time that, yeah, I too would have paid attention if I woke up at four. But when I hit my 40s, for some reason or other, I started a new pattern of sleep. And I'm awake every night between two, three, four in the morning and I can't sleep. And so I feel like there are seasons in our life. And as women, I wonder sometimes if it's just hormonal. Other women have told me that, that when you get older and your hormones keep changing through midlife, it affects your sleep. And so that's a really great question. And I'm still figuring it out. Like, when is it time to say, you know, maybe the Lord's trying to tell me something? And when is it just our body changing and going through hormonal changes. I don't know that I have any great wisdom for that. I'm still figuring it out myself. 
So I'm going to throw the ball back in your court, Pam. You're older than me, a little farther down the road than me. Would you agree with that, that your body is changing? Some of this is body changing when we get older as women? Oh, I totally agree. And I'm thinking, will I ever, ever sleep all night again? And I don't want to be negative, but it's probably not going to happen. I love John McCain's theory on sleep. He said he always slept like a baby. He would sleep two hours, cry for a while, sleep two hours, cry for a while. I thought, that's me. I know. Well, my thought is yes. I think our bodies do change and hormonal things screw up our sleeping. It's just the saddest thing. And I always am laying there thing, saying, God, you said you give your beloved sleep and I am your beloved. So let me sleep. But I recall reading about, I don't know if it was Smith Wigglesworth or one of the great men of God who would get up in the middle of the night if he got awake, go in and stand on the sides of his tub to pray because he knew if he was standing on the sides of his tub, he would not fall asleep. And I thought, oh, wow, I don't know if I could do that, Francis. And so when God's calling, I think sometimes we are urged. I know when I was writing my book, I was urged at times to get up and I would get up and be prosperous in getting up but not to get up and just grumble about praying. (laughs) That probably doesn't work. I can say that whereas 20 years ago, I would have been fretting and worrying that I might be disobeying God if I didn't pray because I was awake. I would say I have reached a place of peace as I'm older that God, if you're telling me to, to pray and I'm missing it, I know that you still love me and you're here with me and you'll help me learn to know your voice even better. For now, I just know that I function better doing what you've created me to do if I sleep for the time and you've created me to sleep and to need sleep. So there are times I definitely, I lay in bed and I pray a lot. I don't get up out of my bed and pray because I do want to go back to sleep because I have a lot to accomplish the next day. That's my two cents that if I really, really, really think I need to get up, I hope that I would obey the Lord and do that, but I also have a place of peace to just trust that he's leading me whether I get up and pray or not. So what else struck you in this chapter? Uh, This little quote struck me. It said, change of pace and change of place equals change of perspective. And that spoke to me, and I know it spoke to you a little differently, but I remember back in the day when my husband and I were, were pastoring a church and It seemed like whenever we would go on vacation or go away, and a lot of times if we went on a cruise, of course, we didn't go on cruises till we were later in life (laughs) because we couldn't. But it almost seemed like when we were away that God would speak to us about changing things in the church or doing something different. And we were more open to it. It's, It's like your mind is refreshed. You're looking from a different angle. You're living, looking at different scenery. And for some reason, the Spirit of God can start to speak to you about, here's what I want you to do when you go back. And so it gives you this refreshed vision of what to do. And I love that because I remember he was asked to work at Cornerstone Television in Pittsburgh. And it was right before we left on a cruise. And he just was not, didn't know if he should do it. He was conflicted by it. And we went on vacation and It was interesting how the Spirit of God just spoke to him and said, this is what I want you to do. And we got back with a new perspective and he was ready to go. How did you see this chapter? Well, I definitely agree that it's good for us to get away and become untangled from the regular things of life that we need to be doing, but we just need a break. And I definitely love getting away. People say to me, oh, you drive to Nashville a lot, or when I drive other places for gigs and it's a long drive, don't you mind that? Not at all, because that is a way for me to unplug from everything and just listen to the Lord and pray and, and listen to things. And I always come back with a fresh perspective. And when you're building a field of dreams, like the chapter says, I think you need to step away from it sometimes and just get a bigger perspective. I was intrigued how important it is to go back to geographical spots where you felt God speak to you. It was a cow pasture in Indiana where Mark first felt called to the ministry. For me, lately, 
I've been riding my bicycle. I got a used bicycle in the spring, and, and I, for a long time, was riding it on the Newville Trail. And then I have been veering off onto little back roads of Newville. And I must confess that I have wanted to live in Nashville from the first time I visited Nashville. I would beg God to let me move there. And finally, years later, I remember so clearly one day he said, not yet. And from then on, I just had peace and I stopped asking, I stopped begging. And then my mother started really aging and needed me near her. And I was so glad that I hadn't moved and that I was here to take care of her and be with her through the last days of her life. But now I, I would say that sometimes I still have tolerated living here because I'd rather be living there. But this summer, as I've been riding my bike, I've been paying attention to geographical things in the area that I never really noticed before. And I guess it's because you, you go only 10 or 12 miles an hour on the little back roads and you can see things better. And so I've been taking pictures of, of sites around Newville that are beautiful. And I've created a Facebook album of all the reasons I love Newville. But since they've extended the trail here in Newville, it now goes through the farm where I grew up. The farm where the living room was my stage, the front step of the house was my stage, the pond and the ice skating was my stage. And as I'm riding my bicycle past my farm where I grew up, I'm listening to music that I've now written and recorded and I'm doing a Christmas show because of this. And there is such an electricity in my heart as I'm driving by. And it's this geographical spots are so crucial to our journey and I think it's beautiful how he, he pointed out that going back to those spots can be really important because it reminds us number one how God was speaking to us back then and number two how far he's brought us like our field of dreams is an idea starts as an idea and then it grows into a field and if you build it they will come well it takes a long time to build a field it takes a long time for people to come but going back to those spots or taking time away, like you said, to just gain perspective is really crucial, really important on our journey toward our dreams. Another thing that struck me in this chapter was his whole idea that God-ordained dreams often go through a death and resurrection, which made me think of something our pastor recently said in a message, and I wrote it down he said, you may feel buried right now, but you're really only just planted. And he was talking about you might feel buried underneath all your circumstances. They're on top of you. You are overwhelmed. But remember that there's something still being planted. Even in the midst of this, God is doing something. And I really resonated with that, that there have been times when I thought my dream for my field of dreams was dying, but it's actually been resurrected. And it, it started with my Big Blue Sky CD. It was the first CD I did. And I did a big release concert called Under the Big Blue Sky. And I had a set designer come in and she created Sky on the platform with blue curtains. And, and we rented a grand piano and I released the album. And, and it was $2,000 to do that concert. And I look back now, compared to what Portraits of White costs, that's pocket change but for then it was huge for me it was it was a big step of faith and then I did another one I did a My Refuge release concert and it was all candlelight and it was really mystique and mysterious and and then I did I Still Believe and I did it at the Capitol Theater in Chambersburg and I worked really hard to make that a big deal. We had a dancer and again, we had the grand piano and singers and I thought that was expensive and costly and a big ordeal, but a lot of things went wrong in that concert and many people didn't notice, but I did. And I, I remember feeling really down about it and I, I kind of retreated and kind of gave up on the whole idea of doing a big concert like that on stage where I sell tickets until years later when I went through my journey with Christmas and started writing Portraits of White and, and that concert came to be. And I look back and I say, mm -hmm. when I thought something was being buried, it was still planted deep in my heart. It just needed time. Maybe it was the wrong time. Maybe it was just 
me not being able to feel adequate to build that dream yet. But he said, don't put a period where God is only putting a comma. Now discerning what's a period and what's a comma in our life, that can be hard. But Pam, what anything else in this chapter that that struck you and your journey? I love the quote, more often than not, what we perceive as a no is really a not yet. So there's still that faith to believe that God has a plan for each one of us. And you might be saying out there, well, why hasn't it happened? Why hasn't it happened? And God's saying, it's not a no, it's just a not yet. Because, you know, we really have to be prepared in our spirit, and we don't know if we are. Let's say somebody wants to go out and travel and sing and do this and do that. Maybe they wouldn't be able to do it physically. Maybe they would say, oh, man, I thought I wanted this, but I'm so tired. I I just can't do it. God knows all that. And so we have to keep in mind that he knows the beginning from the end. He sees the big picture. We don't see the big picture at times. So that's kind of what I perceive from that, that he's not saying no. He's just saying either you're not ready or it's not time. Timing is everything, don't you think? I agree. And and his times are not the same as our times. I'm going to close with something he said in the end of that chapter. The Bible is full of field of dream moments. If Noah would build the ark, God would send the animals two by two. If Elisha would dig ditches in the desert, God would flood them. If the widow would borrow empty jars, God would fill them with oil. I think one recurring theme that I'm feeling as I read this book again this year is just a reminder that we follow our dreams because of nudges that we have in our heart. And to keep focused on the dream giver and not the dream. And I love how in the beginning he starts this chapter with, if you build it, they will come. But he ends the chapter by saying, if you build it, he will come. And I just, I needed that encouragement right now in the midst of even planning portraits of white. Yes, I'm building it, but I'm trusting that he's going to finish it and he will come. Oh uh...